Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the New Ground Life and Leadership Podcast. I'm here to help you thrive as a follower of Jesus, wherever you are and in whatever you're going through. Today, it is a real honor to be joined by a friend of New Ground, Kemi Collioso, who's a speaker, a wife, a mother, and founder of Courageous Conference, as well as the Courageous Sisters Charity. And as we were talking beforehand, Kemi, you and I, you're a very busy lady <laughs> with all the things that you've got going on. Uh, you're also an end of life care educator um, and nurse for several decades. And so, Kemi, I'm really excited to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, well, Kemi, let's um, I'll tell you what, let's, let's dive in with that, this opening question of the, the past year or past six months. What's one of the things that you've learnt most about uh, yourself or about leadership, something you feel God's really put on your heart? Um, I think for all of us, the past month, uh, six, year, uh, six years, past mm -hmm. six months or a year has been it's been interesting. Uh, I think it's been challenging. Um, I think for me as a leader, I think um, just as we went into lockdown, there was a lot of practical stuff that we had to get done and make sure we're pastoring the church right and reaching out to people whilst dealing with what is just the awful situation that we found ourselves with COVID and all that. So um, I think as a leader, I just learnt even more so to be flexible. I am quite, I am quite flexible in all the things that I do, but um, stepping out of my comfort zone and doing some things that I probably felt a little bit uncomfortable about. Um, I also think it was a huge time for reflection and especially the past six months there's been a lot of reflection that's been going on for me personally so really thinking as we hit January and we were still in lockdown but knowing that sooner or later things are going to open up and looking back and asking God what have I learned in this journey I think everyone coming out of this past year and a bit that we've had um, if you come out unchanged then something's gone wrong there um, but coming up and thinking, OK, what has changed in me and what has changed in my walk with God? And I think um, one of the things that God was teaching me a lot about is um, really just he's been taking me deeper into his word. I love the word of God. I read the word of God a lot. But really just God saying, actually, there is something deeper I'm doing. And it's a time mm. to just pull back and really dig deeper into his word. And I kept saying, but I read it anyway. And God's like, no, there's another level to it. And just really praying into that and saying, what does that look like? And, um, you know, we were talking earlier about the fact that I am a storyteller. So when it comes to really deep theology, I'm like, you know, it's, it's, and God's like, no, I want you to go there. And I did. And I feel that, you know, coming out of lockdown, I'm coming out a stronger person in the word, but also in my walk with God. And a few things, you know, like disciplines. Um, I made this bold statement at the beginning of lockdown that I wanted to emerge from lockdown fitter and not fatter. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I happened to say it and it was recorded and everyone has been asking me. <laughs> and when I said that, I thought lockdown was going to last three months. And like one year and three months later, honestly, I'm killing myself. <laughs> so can we say that we're out of lockdown now and I can eat cake? <laughs> I am fitter and I'm not fatter. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> so I did it. But lot, there are just lots to reflect on over yeah. the last year or six months or so. And there's certainly been something in that about... Um, becoming fitter both spiritually and physically isn't there we've kind of seen when we've been locked down we've we've needed to look after our our general well-being which affects so much more than just reading a bible it's actually about our emotional well-being relational well-being um i guess as someone that people see most often from new ground perspective as someone who's speaking regularly and leading um what are some of the the, the kind of the anchors that really help you stay grounded and stay balance stay growing um, through perhaps some of the darker times that no doubt you've walked through as we all have over the past year where have been some of your lifelines uh, you mentioned the word of god i guess that's a key one for you yeah I, I think one big lifeline for me and it sounds really simple but it's my quiet time um it's one thing that i cherish a lot and as life gets busy i think what people tend to do is that bit gets squeezed out um, and one of the things God was speaking to me about is that you're not just studying the word in order to preach the word, you're studying it in order to be anchored in me. And so making sure that my 
studying for preaching the word or, or discipling or mentoring, it's very separate from studying to build me and to grow closer to God. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very routine person. <laughs> I like routine. So that works in my favor when it comes to having a quiet time, because I'm like, I'm getting up at this time, I'm gonna do this and that, and I will do it. I'm kind of a little bit like that. Um, so being able to just spend time in God's word, journal, pray, and that extended time, that's what lockdown did actually. It gave me extended time. I didn't have to rush to go into the office or anything. I could use that time to really dig deep. And I think the, the, the more I dug into God's word, the more I found, verses that anchored me, um, verses that reminded me that, you know, so sometimes people will come and say, you know, when you read, the, you look at the news and you think so many thousand people died in one day and it's awful, it was awful. And fear, you can allow fear to take hold if you're not careful. And every time I thought about the awfulness of what was happening, I'd go to the word of God and say, actually, what does the word of God, say? you know, whatever is true, that's the kind of thing that I want to dwell on. Mm. So the word of God for me has been just pivotal and then writing it everywhere, post-its everywhere. <laughs> mm. yeah, can you give us, um, I often find it really helpful to just kind of get under the, the, the lid of leaders and, and get some of the specifics. So you're obviously quite disciplined with your quiet time. Can you break it down for us? Some of the, ex what does it exactly look like for Kemi Colioso in the morning when you, what time do you wake up? What, you know, what's your routine? Those sorts of things, I think. Okay. Having a, yeah, go for that. <laughs> Just, just to say out there, I'm very different. Like I said, I'm a little bit of an anorak. <laughs> an anorak, nice. <laughs> so um, this is me. So this is what it looks like for me. I wake up about six or six thirty in the morning. Um, I, I've got a place where I go. My chair's there, my Bible's there, my journal, and I've got my uh, music on Spotify. I make a cup of tea first. <laughs> There's that bit in me that is very British. So I get my cup of tea <laughs> and I sit down and I just sit there for a bit. I don't delve straight in. I just sit there and I just quiet myself a little bit. Um, especially if the kitchen's been left in a mess, I need to come and just. Um, and then I, I often would have a devotional that I'm using, um, which is probably really simple you version one that gives you one verse and something to say but then so I'd read that that would be the first thing I read the one verse and then whatever um, words are, are used to support it and then I am then working through a whole book of the bible so what I would then do is read at the moment I'm reading Matthew so I'll read a whole chapter of Matthew and after that, I will then have a journal and write down things that I feel that I've jumped out to me verses. Uh, verses that are very familiar, I tend to go over them again and again, because sometimes you can be so familiar with the word that you don't let allow, allow the word to inform you anymore, speak to you anymore. You just gloss past it. And reading the Gospels, we've all read the Gospels several times. But there's so many nuggets in there that if you just slow down, even the stories, if you slow down, I love a story. So I slow down and I just really just dwell on everything. Mm -hmm. Write things down that I think God is saying. And then I know it sounds long. long. I, I love Phil Moore's books um the series he does on the bible so i would read whatever ch chapter corresponds to whatever i'm reading in the word of god and again i get um a lot more background to that um and after i've done that i will then um i have a song list on spotify which is called my worship and there's songs that i just find easy to worship to so i will play those and then i just stand up and i pray and that's it wow that's really helpful. I mean, just in and how so how long does that take you to start your day like that? It's about an hour, an hour and a bit. I and because of lockdown, I can go a, an hour and a half sometimes. It's a long time. Yeah. And like I say, it's me. I don't have little children. And um, when my kids were little, there's no way that I've got an hour, an hour and a half <laughs> to do that. And um, so it's the luxury of being a mum of grown up kids, I suppose, and also not having. Um, so even when I had to be at work at nine o'clock, that would probably still be I would do about an hour um, and then go off to work. But now that I don't need to be in the office so early, I can do mm. that. Mm. You mentioned sitting in your chair and taking a moment, particularly if the, the kitchen's messy. Are you ever tempted to go and tidy the kitchen first? <laughs> you have to resist that. 
<laughs> while the kettle's boiling, I do sort of do a quick tidy up. But, you know, yeah. So you do need a moment to say, this is not the state I left the kitchen in when I went to. <laughs> That's the other thing with having grown up kids, because all my, all the, but all the boys at home at the moment, both of them and my daughter-in-law, um, is that you, you go to bed and that's when they start cooking. And you're just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> No, help you mentioned it wasn't necessarily like that when you when your boys were younger obviously you have two boys um what would be some of your what did it look like for you when they were young what would be some of your advice to, to mums with young children at home okay so um the two boys are 16 months apart okay so they are very yeah they are wow. very close yeah let's not just that's tiring that was tiring <laughs> I, I I often joke and I don't think it's a joke actually I don't remember the first five years <laughs> I think I was like walking around in a trance um, because I was working full time as well. So working full time, serving in the church, two small boys. How do you juggle all that? And um, so my quiet time, those seasons were tough seasons. I'm not going to you know, gloss over it. They were tough seasons. Um, but I think there was a foundation in me about the, wanting to read the word of God. There was always mm. that foundation. So whatever time I could grasp, I would use it. Um, so I would, um, you know, make sure that I tried to get up a little bit earlier than the boys would. And they're very active boys. And the minute, you know, those kids that wake up and you're just like, they're, they're like alive and, uh, you know, just you've got two boys haven't you i have three boys yeah three boys yeah so you know what i'm talking about they're just good to go so trying to get up before them and not reading as much as i'm reading now but i would probably then just stick to a very simple devotional one verse what's god saying and then it start the day mm -hmm. i'd pray worship tended to be in the car so incorporating my worship time when taking the boys to to school was brilliant because it meant they could worship as well so from an early age my boys knew all the grown-up songs as it were not you know they weren't just singing Arky Arky they were singing you know Kirk Franklin they were singing Hill's song they were singing whatever it is that I was listening to um and really just make it you know I you know making sure that life was a little bit orderly and getting the boys involved they were involved in everything you know when we were serving when the church was small we so we're, the church had been planted about a year when we joined it, uh, Jubilee Church, which was called King's Church then. And um, we'd go there and set the chairs out and they'd set, the, it would be their job to set the chairs out. And uh, whilst, you know, Toppy's doing something or I'm doing something. So we served as a family and that made it a lot easier. And then snatching every moment for family time, that was important. So, and making it fun, actually, just making serving God fun, making, um, my you know just my worship time and even what if I was in the car and wanted to pray I said okay boys mommy's gonna pray now you know and I'd pray and God God you know every kind of prayer rises up to God you know it's not about being in that quiet space God knows what season you're in mm. and he knows what you he knows your heart and so even the days that I didn't quite make that Bible, you know, my Bible study time, God knows because I'm human. <laughs> there are days that I overslept. There are days that it was absolute chaos. But when I got back, I felt as if God, you know, God never leaves you anyway. So when you kind of get back into the routine, you're like, oh, God's here all the time. So that's probably, I mean, for anyone who's got little children, it is, it is, it is harder um, to have that kind of diligence but keep at it you know don't let it slip don't let it go for too long without actually spending time with God because mm. that's what gives you the fuel I think what people do is they substitute oh I'm so busy so I can't do this actually you're going to get busier and it's going to get more frazzled if you dig into the word and make sure the foundation is there then all these other things as the Bible says will be added on to you and that includes that kind of orderly calm sort of life that you want mm, that's really helpful what would you say to your mums um particularly around the area of raising boys, because it seems that churches aren't always, they sometimes struggle to keep boys, let's say that. Um, there's, there's a, it's an environment that typically requires a lot of sitting or listening and 
I, I'm not stereotyping here, but generally, well, I am stereotyping. Generally, boys find it very nice that my three really don't sit still for long at all. So to save me, Kami, what, Kemi, what would you say to, uh, to mums with boys and how have you helped keep them engaged in church and led them to the Lord and, mm. um, and walk that journey of tension between, the, you know, the sports clubs that boys typically want to get involved with and all of that? What would be some of your advice there? Um, so, yeah, my boys didn't sit still either. So the first two years like I say the 16 months between us so about the first three years I probably spent church looking through the glass window <laughs> so after worship we'd, we'd literally be, have to take them outside because they're not going to sit still um, and they at that time they didn't even have a Sunday school because the church was so small and I wanted to listen to the sermon and my kids were the only kids in church so I'd just stay outside these double doors and put my ear to the door to hear <laughs> going on that is and just let them run up, up and down the corridor is is what boys do um but I think for churches it's it's important it, it's more about how it's led from the front and so whenever Toppy's up front leading, if a child is, is sort of unsettled, he will always say, to the, he will say it out loud, it's okay, because the mums need to know it's okay. You know, kids are not, little boys are not gonna be quiet in service. So him saying, it's all right, you know, just gives the mum just a bit of, okay, the, past, the pastor knows and he's seen us and he doesn't feel frazzled by it. Um, we, you know, stewards will often help the, the, the mum or whatever. And it's training people to not make mums feel they're in the wrong place with their kids because their kids are making noise. This is what kids do. Um, we always have a room for them to, you know, where mums can go. But with my boys, it was also, like I say, I, we made sure that we served together. But also we, in, it was, there was an intentionality about bringing them up in the way of the Lord. So we didn't just allow it to happen. We were intentional about forming it and guiding them. Um, we always prayed over them from an early age that may they grow to know the Lord. So that's always number one, just praying over your children, saying, Lord, and girls, you know, I want them to grow up to know you. Mm. Making Bible stories interesting and exciting. So bedtime, Bible time, uh, bedtime routine was not me. It was, it was their dad because they preferred him reading the Bible stories because he'd act it out and he'd do the voices. And so, you know, Noah and the Ark became so exciting and, and Samson and, you know, and he didn't, he didn't even just read the, the typical sort of children Bible stories. He would go and find, you know, blind man, the, you know, the blind, the, the blind man from Bethsaida and he'd act it out for them. So they grew up loving the, the, you know, the stories in the Bible and believing that, you know, they could trust in this God who was able to do all these wonderful things. And then as a family, we made prayer, our prayer life just normal. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't this, I mean, I'm an African and sometimes, you know, in growing up, it can be this burden I remember going on holiday to visit an aunt and they had this 5 a.m prayer time I'm like who does that <laughs> and, and as a kid I was just like I in the end I was like this is not a holiday I'm not coming back <laughs> you know, we all had to get up and like kneel on the floor and and you know and you, we were all asleep and then all you heard was amen and then you're like oh okay no <laughs> it's just not it so for us praying was just something that we just did normally if we were about to leave the house, it was like, let's hold hands and we'd commit our day to God. And then we'd go very quick before we get to, you know, in front of the school gate, we'd have a quick break. So it became routine, something that they just knew how to do. Investing in their friendships in church. So I would always prioritize having a friend over who was from church and from school. In fact, I always, they never were the ones to go to their friends' houses at school. It was like, no, they've got to come to us because I need to monitor what you're watching, what you're doing as they get older as well. Um, but also making church fun. And so at the end of church, they knew that they could run around and run wild. So there was that kind of thing, whilst we're in church, we're gonna worship and then you're gonna go out to your Sunday school or, or whatever. And then at the end, you can spend time playing with your friends and it was pretty safe. And so they grew up actually enjoying church. Um, as a family, we always spoke well of church. So they never had this sort of um, double standard where we're like, hallelujah in church. And then at home, you're like, you know, that kids pick that up very quickly. And they begin to see that actually what you're professing, you're not actually living. Um, they might not say it, but it's, it's sinking in. Mm. As they grew, they wanted to play football, Sunday football. Yeah. Um, 
this is where planning comes in. If you are a parent, find out what every, every stage your child is going to go into. What are the tensions that you're going to walk into? So with boys, we knew it was going to be the Sunday sports. Um, so early on, we said to them, we're happy for you to play football on a Saturday. Well, the minute it goes to Sunday, then church has to take priority and that's for us as a family because you know dad's serving mum's serving I can't be standing at the football field you know on a Sunday it's just not going to work if there's an evening thing then we can make it work so they knew that early on almost you know from the age of about seven we'd said that to them um we also made sure that they had alternatives. So most, both my boys are musicians. And so from an early age, they, they were playing music and they loved that. And there were other things that they could do. So it wasn't that we're taking this one thing away from them. The minute um, football went to Sunday, I could see his face. And it's hard for a mum, honestly, it really is hard. You always think that your son's gonna be the next thing you're right. Or for those of you who are younger, I don't know, Gareth Bale, is he still playing? I have no idea. <laughs> Ian um, White is going back a few years. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I suddenly thought. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, you know, so we always, and, 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 you know, I thought they were good, you know, as most parents think their kids are the best footballers on the pitch. And um, but having to say to them, OK, it's gone to Sunday. Do you remember what we said? And they did. And they were happy. Um, and we just replaced it with um, drum lessons on a Saturday or I think or something like that. And I can honestly say that it was probably one of the best decisions we made regarding the boys um, because they're both accomplished musicians now. Um, so God rewards us for our faithfulness. If you mm. trust him and put him first, then he always does reward us. It might, you know, it, you might not see it immediately, but eventually you will see uh, the goodness of God in all that he does um, when it concerns our children. Mm. Um, and really just to touch a little bit on teenage boys. So <laughs> teenagers in London, teenage black boys in London, um, that was that were those were interesting years and again one of the things that you always hear is that oh you wait till the teenage years it starts from oh you wait till they're um toddler um, you know teen, was it toddler tantrums and then it's uh, the teenage years are going to be awful and I just refused to accept that I was like that's not that I don't see that in the bible mm. it doesn't say that in the bible you know psychologists say that but we take it as gospel truth but it isn't they don't have to be <laughs> terrible teenagers they are going to go through stuff they are dealing with their hormones and you know there's a lot of independence that they want to walk into and we as parents so there is that tension but you can navigate that well by understanding what your teenager is going through mm. and still making sure that those boundaries are there but you just release you relax them a little bit so the boundaries are a little bit wider um you know if bedtime was I don't know, eight o'clock, then bedtime's later and, and little things like that. Um, and trusting God. I think teenage boys in London was a scary time. Um, and both my boys had been mugged, coming home from school, had their phones stolen and just things like that. And as a mother, you can be racked with fear and not let them be who God wants them to be because you are mm. now gonna drop them off at the school gate and pick them up. Or you put the necessary things in place, but you trust them to God. So those were quite, we taught them, you know, it's like if someone comes up, it's sad, isn't it sad that we have to teach our boys how to deal with things like this. Mm. If someone comes up and wants your phone, just give it to them, you know, and uh, but my eldest son is not the kind of person who's just going to give his phone to anybody. <laughs> so that was scary. I was just like, please just don't fight it. Um, and they just, you just teach them to be streetwise and to trust God and to not fear man. Um, mm. I think I've covered quite a bit there. You have, oh, so superb. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> But that whole, that, I mean, that like you alluded to there, I mean, that once your boys were mugged, it must have been awful for you as a mum, but then to, to let them go out again, that must be so hard. And I think, you know, parents who aren't Christians, I don't know how they do it, because I think there seems to be so much need to, like you said, to trust God, it's, you know, to say trust God sounds easy, but the reality of just letting them go and go beyond the house into the world, and you don't know what's happening. And I mean, these days we've got trackers on our phones, so I can always track my kids. <laughs> But, yeah, I couldn't. <laughs> my phones could barely ring. <laughs> um, yeah, how did how did you do that? What would be some advice on how to 
work that out and yeah trust God in moments of fear like that I think remembering that these kids were given to me by God you know they're a, they're a gift from him and I think in my life generally I've had to learn to trust God in a lot of situations right from my teenage years just met um just growing up in a, a situation where I had to put a lot of trust in God and so for me it was very much okay what can you do Kenny you know are you going to follow them to school every single day and pick them up every single day? You're a working mother. You can't do that. You know, your husband's not around to do that. Um, are you going to wrap them up and keep them in the house forever? No. Are you going to homeschool? God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not my, that's not my gifting. Um, so just asking myself these questions and thinking, okay, so what is the alternative? You've get, we've got to let these boys walk to school and walk, but especially in winter when it's dark. Um, so do what you can, you know, so I say to them, if you're gonna be late, let me know. You've got a phone, make sure it's charged. If there's any problem, just, you know, you know, find somewhere safe and make sure that you're in safe hands and things like that. Um, don't want, don't go off to friends' houses, not telling me and stuff like that. So you put in place what you can do. And then you have to go back to God and say, Lord, they're in your hands. Um, if you've given to me, them to me, then you will protect them. And this is where praying in the morning helps because I pray protection over my family. I say, Lord, be, be their shield. And then God will say, but you prayed this morning. Do you trust me? yes lord i trust you does it mean that my heart doesn't beat when it's late and they're like 30 minutes and they're not home they're 30 minutes of course it does but i have to take those emotions and say actually no i'm not going to fear i'm going to trust in god i'm going to trust in god and it's almost like repeating it almost like a mantra to yourself and it sounds silly but you have to do that or else you're going to allow the fear that the enemy puts there you begin to think of them in a ditch somewhere you know my my son um he in order the older one's a drummer um, and he's very lively and he's, you know, very spontaneous. But in order to teach him a little bit of um, just just to, just to contain him a little bit, we made him go to we made him go to orchestra club. <laughs> and uh, as a drummer in orchestra club, all you do is you stand there <laughs> for this one boom. <laughs> Oh, I know we're cruel, but we thought that it would really just teach him discipline because drummers can do whatever they want. They can improvise, they can come, they can. But I thought just being in orchestra, we'll just teach him a little bit of discipline and how to read music, but he hated it. So <laughs> half, the time, half the time he wouldn't go and I'd get a phone call from the school. And when the school calls you at about, you know, four o'clock, your heart does leap, you know, you're like, oh my goodness, what's this? And um, the teacher would always come and say, uh, hello, is that Mrs. Collios? I'm like, yes, it's me. And the house down, I think they're in detention. That's when they only, that's when they called me that they're in detention. Um, but she would say, um, nothing to worry about, but it's just that uh, Femi hasn't turned up for orchestra club. <laughs> and uh, the first time it happens, like, oh my goodness, what's happened to him? Anyway, he turned up at home, so I don't want to go. Um, but after that, I just knew that phone call meant he wasn't at orchestra club and I could get hold of him. And I, I would ring him and I'd say, turn right back and go to orchestra club and, <laughs> and, go to orchestra. and so but if you if you allow every phone call from the school to make you go into a tizzy then that's just hard you've just got to believe that there are they are god's kids and he is god and i'm not <laughs> so no matter what i do i can't protect them he can mm -hmm. i know you shared at the fearless conference which was just before the first lockdown wasn't it yeah <laughs> I think there was a lot of conversations about, you know, should this go ahead? Um, but we did it. It was great. And um, yeah. we're really blessed. But I know you shared, you shared a lot of your, your story there um, about how you almost grown up in an environment where you were made to feel fearful because um, you've been in hospital so much as a baby and then as a child recovering from um, an accident. What were some of the, remind people who are there and those who weren't there, what are some of the things that you would say to people who do really battle with fear and some of the things that you've learned to help you overcome fear to the point that, you know, as you said, you're standing on a platform talking to hundreds of women uh, and you, you do that a lot from what I've seen on social media. You are, you know, a, a very busy communicator who's a sought after woman um, in leadership. <laughs> what are some of the lessons on how to, how to confront fear, which I guess as a parent translates to just generally with fear? Yeah, um, I think for me, so like you say, sort of growing up, not being allowed to do a lot. 
so having um so i you know spent the first year of my life in hospital and then at the age of nine was involved in this massive car accident um, and because my condition that kept me in hospital was a heart condition it meant that there was a lot of things that I couldn't do like run and jump and you know just normal kid stuff mm. um and then having the accident as well on top of it just made my parents freak out like every time I it looked like I was doing something slightly dangerous I just get like ah, don't you know what we went through and all that kind of you know <clears throat> with a very African accent and I was like oh you know um so I just learned to just be so cautious and I think this is where the root of fear just took hold not just even traveling on my own would just make me panic you know real panic um going off to university was a big step because it was it was just filled with so many worries um but I think that the very first thing that I would say helped and is just giving my life to Christ you know the minute I gave my life to Christ God was then able to walk, work in me with some of those fears. Um, and what I then did was I read a lot of books around um, being bold and stepping out in boldness and not being fearful. So really just dwelling, I knew what my weakness was. I think that was it. I recognized what my weakness was and I recognized that this was going to be something that would hold me back. Um, I couldn't make friends easily. I never, I mean, once my mom, <laughs> my mom said to me, uh, are you okay why don't you ever go out I mean I think it's the, probably the first time a mother has asked her teenage daughter why why they don't go out I just never left the house it was just that mm. but I knew that having given my life to Christ I knew that God had so much more for me than this existence of just being on my own and being fearful about everything and so building myself up I didn't always know the verses to go to we didn't have Google in those days um, so I would often just read books around not being fearful and how you are you know fearfully and wonderfully made and things like that and I think just on underlying things like that and repeating them to myself but it always comes to the point where you have to take a step you have to do something out of your comfort zone and that's where it comes to the you know whether you're going to do it or not if you don't do it then you never know that God's got you this is what faith is it's an, it's an action you've got to do something so I can't remember I think maybe it was the very first time I had to travel very far on my own and I thought I can't do it and I felt sick and I you know as the day came closer I thought I can't do this and I just feel God saying you can do this you can do this you know just trust me in this and I did it and ever since then, it's almost as if I broke something, that something just broke in me that, oh, OK, nothing happened. I'm still OK. I can do this. So even and yes, I speak a lot and, and I'm on stage a lot. But every now and again, that enemy just always wants to put that fear on the inside of you. But he knows better than to just make me fearful. What he would then do is make me doubt myself and say, you know, are you, you know, are you sure you know you, you've studied well for this or are you sure you've done that? But I can't stress enough how important it is to have the word of God on the inside of you because it's when, it's in those moments that the word of God gives you the courage to then say, no, actually I can do this because greater is he who is in me. And, you know, yes, it sounds as if you're just quoting verses, but actually I really, I believe them. I'm not just pulling them off my head. I believe them. And so I step out and do it. And I think with, with, you know, with our children, I think we, we, that we hear so much now because we have so much news thrown at us. Mm. The opportunity to be even more fearful is there because you just hear all these awful things. And it's very, I mean, I don't envy parents today because you are just bombarded with just all kinds of stuff. At some point, you have to switch that news thing off. At some point, you've got to decide I'm not following that person because all I get is just this negativity and decide I'm going to trust God in this with the caveats that you put in place and I think for me it's 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 it was a journey it's not something that happened straight away every single bold step I took was a battle mm. but the only way you're going to win the battle is to step out and fight the battle mm. but knowing that you've got God on your side mm. um, and I, I, I yeah I think that's probably the way I approach it mm. 
Well, you are really very inspiring, inspiring to listen to. And the sermons I've heard and when my wife came back from the conference, she was just blown away really by the story and the way that God has walked with you through fear. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Cameron, we mentioned before we started recording that um, I think it's, it's at the time of recording, it's a couple of days after the anniversary of the death of George Floyd in America. And as a Nigerian woman, as a black woman, um, actually, I know Toppy put something out quite close to um, George Floyd's death a year ago that really was a, acted as a provocation to many church yeah. pastors. I just... Um, yeah, maybe maybe there's a link here to to fear, but your experience as a black woman in London, um, and what yeah, how, how, what what's it been like in the past year as a result of George Floyd's murder? How did that affect you personally? Where are some ways that you've been encouraged by the church response or even discouraged? Um, would you mind speaking into some of that for us? Help us to understand. Yeah, so George Floyd. Yeah, it was a year on the twenty fifth, I think. Um, when the world saw those awful images of mm. um, the police officer um, kneeling on, he, on his neck. Do you know, I'm even getting emotional now. Um, I think for me, watching that, it was hard because it wasn't a film. Mm. It was real life. That was a real person on the floor um in full view of the world and this guy that just seemingly didn't care and as I watched that as a black woman as a mother and a wife I kept thinking that could have been my husband that could have been my son that could have been me um that that was happening to hmm. um and it was for nine minutes and I think 26 seconds or something like that as this poor man just you know cried I can't breathe and I think it, it, in a way, it, 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 it just, I'm someone who, you know, if I do face racism, I, I quite, you know, I can, I can push through it. I can push through it. Um, but also I, you know, I grew up in Nigeria. I, I, came, I was born in London, raised in Nigeria, and then came back to London when I was in my twenties. So I probably missed the sort of the eighties when it was quite, um, difficult it's still difficult now um so I was it was quite hurtful it's quite very painful very emotional for me as a black woman mm. like I said and um it was very difficult to process, process it and it still is and I think a year on you'd want to think that things are better but I you know a year on in America I think almost over 200 black boy, men women have been killed since George Floyd by the police, mm. by, by you know the police, and um, to think that is somebody that who was supposed to be pre protecting him, you know, is the, just all those emotions. And then you think about our situation here in the UK, and sometimes we can be a little bit um, blinkered and think, oh, it's not that bad. Well, praise God, our police do not carry firearms and just shoot willy nilly because you know 200 in the I had to read that over and over again. That's a lot of people um, shot by the police. Um, but it just makes you realize that we are still, progress has been made in that we are having the conversations. And I think that's, that's, that's really helpful. I think progress has been made in that there are a lot of um, white pastors, churches or whatever that haven't really understood what we, what we live through as a black person um, in, in the UK. And so that's been helpful to have the conversation on the table and, Honestly, it's been the responses I've got for maybe my friends have been mm. quite helpful. So, you know, our church is very diverse. So it's got, you know, it's, it's in London. So it represents London very well. Um, but a lot of, you know, white, our eldership team is mixed, diverse and stuff like that. So I have a lot of white friends. And one of my friends I remember was almost in tears. She said, I never quite understood. And she said, help me you know help me understand so being able to talk about it and not feel that you are um just crying wolf every minute is mm. really helpful you know my boys have been stopped and searched i don't know how many times they they don't even bother telling me anymore um yet they've never ever done anything wrong never carried you know you know it's just mm. it's not fair um and even sometimes fear comes into it. So I, I will say to them, when the police pulls you over, please just put your hands where they can see it. Be, be polite, come out. 
again, I, I think it's sad that as a mother, I have to talk to my kids like that. Mm. From the minute they, you know, they became teenagers, I, to the extent that sometimes I'd say to them, oh, please don't wear your hood. And they're like, mom, we're wearing our hoodie because we're cold. Yeah, but put your hood down. Why am I saying that? Why am I trying to change who they are in order for society to accommodate them? You see what I mean? It's, mm. it's not right. And so I love the fact that we are able to talk about it. And yes, you know, Jubilee the topic came out and put a statement out. And um, I think he, a lot of white pastors then contacted him and said, look, help us. And I think that's great that people actually want to learn and want to understand what it feels like from our point of view um, and do something about it. Um, and I think that's the important thing is just not to hear and applaud it, but actually to act and to call it out where you see it and to speak up. And I think it's even for me, like I say, in the early days, I probably just shrugged and just let it go. But I got a little convicted that actually maybe I should, there are times that I should have spoken up when I felt I was treated unjustly, but I just thought, you know, I'm just gonna let that one go. Um, I remember one particular incident actually, uh, being a nurse and, um, I was working in the district and I was going to see uh, a guy in his home and he opened the door and he went, oh no, I don't want you. And he closed the door. I was like, what was that about? So I went back to the office and I said, um, he just opened the door and he said, oh, I don't want you. I said, does he not need seen to? They went, yes, he does. So they rang him up and he said, yeah, I don't want the black nurse. And I, that was the first time I remember being absolutely furious. I was like, are you kidding me? I am here to do you a service. I'm here to treat you. And your racism still does not allow me to come and do something that's gonna benefit you. That's how deep seated that was. Um, but it was the response of my colleagues that also shocked me because they, were, they said they were about to send a white nurse in. At which point I went, hang on a minute if you do that what are you what are you saying right now what are you saying to that person who won't let me come and treat him mm. you're saying he can pick and choose the color of the care the care the person who comes to give him care i said if you send a white nurse in i'm going to take this all the way this is not right i'm going to go back i said yeah but what if he doesn't let you treat him well he's just going to have to sit there with his gammy leg i'm oh, sorry <laughs> um and so i went back and he said but i said i don't want you and I said, well, you either have me or no one else. It's as simple as that. And I felt if I didn't make a stand there, it would carry on. Mm. And I think for all of us, black and white, we need to stand and we need to speak up and speak out. Because the more you let it go, the more you're saying, oh, it's okay. And even from the little thing, you know, uh, Marcus Rushford, the footballer got a torrent of abuse the other day on social media. Um, and he spoke up, but he's not the only one who gets a torrent of abuse. A lot of black athletes and black footballers get it, but everyone needs to speak up and let people recognize and realize how rife it is. Mm -hmm. So we don't say, oh, UK is okay. No, we're not okay. We're just very good at just sort of hiding it underneath the carpet. So I think, you know, a year on, I'm glad that the conversation is on the table, but I think there's a lot more that we need to see and keep talking about it. Mm -hmm. And not to make the white person feel uncomfortable, but not to ignore the issue either. I mm -hmm. think. Mm. And it seems that certainly as pastors, the, the main area of influence that we've got is within the people of God and to try to make sure that the church does this differently. We've got um, a God who, who created human race as diverse and to reflect some of the, the manifold wisdom of himself. And so there's something that we should have as theological reserves in us. But it seems to me that there's a wait, what I what I observe is we're, and I'd be interested to hear your reflections on this. It seems to me that we're in a culture where everybody feels like they ought to have an opinion on things, um, even though they've never really had the experience. But opinions help keep us feel safe and as though it's not our problem to resolve because, oh, it's complicated. And, oh, have you seen the manifesto of Black Lives Matter as a movement is what you often hear back. And you think you don't do that with every organisation that you you know, want to refute or whatever. Um, is that something that you've observed I guess in the, in the church and just the, the the propensity from say white people to have an opinion and to listen to lots of different voices on an area and try to convince you oh no it's not as it's not as um, it's not as you see it because there's all these other things to consider how does how does that affect you when people talk in those terms and and then how do you in the church I guess really try to change that um, so there's a, a culture of compassion rather than a culture of opinion. 
Yeah, I mean, thankfully, I don't think anyone's actually verbally said things like that to me. I think they've, <laughs> they've probably learned not to. Um, but I've read a lot. I've read a lot of things being said on, in, and it just, it, it, it really upsets me because it's like, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. This is, this is a lived experience and you're trying to explain it away with theories or, or, or opinions and things mm. like that. And I think within the church, um, I think if we as pastors or, or, or leaders really help people understand what kingdom culture is, you know, it really does, you know, it's not about my culture or your culture or black or white, it's kingdom culture. You know, the Bible says there's no Greek or Jew. It's about, you know, loving people as you love yourself, but also opening your eyes and actually recognizing that actually what you think is loving the other person as you love yourself is probably not as pure as you think it is, because there's all this background stuff that mm. you have almost background baggage. And I think this was the um, this was the eye opener for a lot of white people whose hearts are pure that they did not realize that there was quite a lot of kind of background stuff that you just see as normal. It's 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 normal. Um, I was saying to somebody, you do realize that there are certain places I will not go to on holiday, it, you know, in Europe, for instance, because. A, I'm probably going to be the only black person for miles and it's so uncomfortable. Um, I remember going to somewhere um, in, I won't men mention the country, um, but it wasn't the capital. I, I ventured further in and I got stared at, pointed at. It was just uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. If you are a white person, you just don't even think about that. You just, you know, you know, so even going backpacking, you've got to think about it twice. Actually, who have I got with me? Where am I going to? So there's little things like that that people don't understand. So that when we, you know, when you say things like, well, but, you know, not everyone's racist and, and you excuse it away, you're not actually hearing what we're saying. Because some of these things are quite unconscious. There's unconscious bias. You know, some of these things are just ingrained in the culture that we've grown up in that you don't actually experience it the way that I probably will experience it. Another example, there's a girl that um, had just finished her nursing. So what, one of the things I love doing is actually just mentoring up and coming nurses within the church and, you know, just supporting them. And I said to her, where are you going to apply for a job? And she said, oh, I'm going to go there and there. And I said, oh, what about this hospital? She went, oh no, I'll never get, I'll never get um, a job there and I said why she said well there aren't many black nurses in that place and it's true mm -hmm. and when I started my nursing when I was looking for somewhere to do my um, nurse training I purposely didn't go to the prestigious colleges because I never thought I'd get in so these are things that are on the inside of us as well mm -hmm. so we it stops us from entering places so that's why it's important to see black representation everywhere and so I encouraged her, I said, no, we've got to stop this. We've got to actually apply for the jobs because we are good enough. So I encouraged her, she applied for the job. Yesterday, she sent me a text saying she got the job. I was like, yes. Mm. <laughs> so things are changing, but we also, we need to change. And the more we see people like us in different places in society, the more people are gonna feel more encouraged. And I need to encourage people not to shrink back and say, actually, yes, apply for that job. Go to that country. Because if you don't go to that country, then they're never going to get used to seeing black people. Yes, it feels uncomfortable, but actually we need to start pushing against some of these things and saying, we exist. There's a lot of us. <laughs> <laughs> and we're normal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There's, um, I think that's a really helpful point about, well, both sides really, that um, our, our lived experiences really does affect the narratives that we have. You know, the, we talk about privilege. Um, we don't often think of it in terms of privilege. You think, well, it's just the story that I've been told as a, as a man, as a white person, I don't have any barriers to success um, or barriers to overcome. Uh, and when you, when you spoke at the Fearless Conference, a lot of your time, I think you spent also engaging with this whole idea of identity, the understanding who we are, um, that who we are isn't actually, you know, the result of our, our skin colour, of our culture. It's actually because now we're, we're in Christ. How is that, again, um, your, your devotional life? What are some ways, is that, is that played a key part? But how have you, again, 
relearn some of your identity narratives in your head. Um, you talk about black representation there. Has that been quite important? And I guess we might even come on to just talk about female representation in church leadership circles and how has that shaped your identity and sense of what your role ought to be? I think when, for me, talking about identity, I suppose just to give people a bit of context. So um, growing up, my I grew up with my dad. Um, so my 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 parents uh, split up when I was about th- I always thought it was 13 my sister said I was 12 but there you go um, <laughs> so 12 or 13 and the way it happened was a bit traumatic for me um, because I didn't realize my parents were having problems and um, my sister and I arrived home from school one day and just noticed that my mom's stuff had gone and then my dad came back from work that evening and we were like what's going on where's mum where's her stuff and my dad just went she's gone um and that was it and um for me I I kept thinking I remember in the very first few hours or days that he said she's gone I thought is she dead you know I didn't understand he wouldn't talk about it he just would not he just got up and went to work and that was it and I tried to make sense of what was going on and I knew that she couldn't have died so it must be that she just walked out or, or she just took, and, and just being so um, hurt that she couldn't tell us. Um, and I think it's what ensued from there. So there was a lot of kind of um, hurt and anger and unforgiveness towards my mum. And then being left with my dad to bring us up. So he gets married again. And um, he then, I think he just wanted to concentrate on his new family because she started to have children. And so we became almost like, um, a disturbance <laughs> to him and he would often you know just really say really hurtful things um to 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 us as kids so he would often say to me oh you're useless um you you, you you're not going to amount to much and just like words like that he would throw out um and i remember him would always say that actually the best thing that can happen is is if someone marries you um <laughs> So I thought, oh great, um, you know, you're, you're dumb, you're thick. I mean, it was just, you know, a torrent of abuse. Um, so growing up, I grew up with very little self-esteem. Like, you know, first of all, I'm so fearful, I'm shy, I'm an introvert. And now I'm getting told that I'm rubbish and I'm not going to amount to much. So I think that was a lot of baggage that I brought with me, you know, and praise the Lord, I brought the, the baggage and I gave it to Jesus. Um, so this whole sense of who I am is really important. Being able to recognize that, you see, what happens is that when you get fed those kind of things at an early age, it has a way of just, just anchoring into your soul. And no matter how much you achieve it keeps replaying it it just plays this thing in your head and I every time I I I would achieve something it would never mean anything I mean I went to university very very early because I passed the exams yeah I always believed that I was dumb and I was stupid and I was like it just doesn't make sense that you can have all these achievements yet you still believe a lie. And you see, this is where the enemy comes in. Sometimes when you hear people say, I'm no good, I'm no, and you're saying, yeah, but you did this and you did that. That's not it. There's a root that needs to be taken out. There's almost like a deliverance from that way of thinking that needs to happen. Mm. Because no matter how much you achieve, they found what's been sown on the inside is still playing that record over and over. And so something had to break. I, it wasn't about achieving more. Um, it wasn't about getting more degrees. It wasn't about any of those things. It was about recognizing who God had created me to be and asking God to take that. <laughs> I said, Lord, take that record away. I don't want to play that track anymore and just cleanse me. And so it was a process. And one of the things um, that really helped, and I cannot um, push it enough, is forgiveness. Mm. I held a lot of unforgiveness towards my mom who walked out and left me in that situation. I held unforgiveness towards my dad, towards my stepmom. I, I was bitter. Um, and I realized I wasn't moving on. So I was still having those records playing to my head. And it was actually at Stonely. And I think I, I shared this, that it was at Stonely. It was a women's conference. I, no, not a conference, um, seminar in the afternoon. Two o'clock in the afternoon, like <laughs> after lunch. I don't want to go. <laughs> That's, like, that's another story <laughs> um, and 
okay, I'm a leader in church. I have to lead by example. I have to go to this women's seminar. I don't want to go, moaned about it, but I went. I remember sitting at the back and I just absolutely hated everything. I just, I just did not, I didn't want to be there. And, um, and so I sat at the back with a face on me. And I think it was Liz Holden who was preaching and Wendy Virgo was hosting or something. And I don't even remember what they were preaching about. But I remember God saying to me, you've got to let it go. I was like, let what go? And honestly, I'm not hyper spiritual, but I heard if there was a voice in my head that said, you've got to let it go. And I kept questioning. And then I felt God say, you know what, you've got to let go. And I knew exactly what that was, that God is saying, you've got to forgive. And I remember just breaking down and just crying and saying, but it's so hard, you know, kind of what I've been through and stuff like that. And God's like, until you do that, you're not going to be able to enter the best that I have for you. And there was a lady sitting a few, she probably didn't want to be there like me. <laughs> She's like a few chairs away from me. And I tapped her. I don't know who she is till today. And I said, can you pray for me? And I didn't tell her what to pray for. And she just laid hands on me and she just spoke in tongues. She just prayed and I prayed. And I'm not joking, Jess, I just felt a lightness just come over me. I was just like, whoa, I feel so, you know, sometimes you don't feel that, you don't know you're heavy until the burden has been taken off you. And you just feel like, whew, okay. And from that moment on, I was able to enter into everything that God was saying. So before, if I, if I went to a sermon, oh, the sermon was great and everything, but I don't think it really sunk down deep whenever they spoke about your identity, I don't think I really got it. I just got it here, but I never got it in my heart. Mm. From that moment on, just reading verses about who you are in Christ, you know, reading about being fearfully and wonderfully made, reading about being, uh, you know, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And, and that's one of my favorite verses. That's who I am. That's, and I tell you what, every time I read verses about who I am, I am so happy. I just feel like, way, that's, that's who God has made me be. But I believe that until I took that plug of unforgiveness and just yanked it out, I couldn't enter into all that God had for me. And so really knowing your identity, you know, just first of all, check there's nothing blocking God's, you know, God's word coming into your heart. And then just pour, let those words just pour over you over and over again. And I'm so big on raising girls and letting them know who they are in Christ, because if they don't know who they are, then somebody else is going to tell them who they're supposed to be. And that's what social media does constantly. Oh, you're this, you're that. But I'm like, no, that's not who you are. Who does the Bible say you are? Mm. That's, where, that's, that's, that's where we get our identity from. Mm. It's so good. See, God does speak in the afternoon seminars at conferences. Sorry? God does speak in the afternoon conferences, <laughs> afternoon sessions. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's a half asleep, people. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. I know. I just realised. I'm sure Liz is going to listen to this and Wendy. I'm so sorry. I love them really. <laughs> you know, they were probably speaking on forgiveness, Kemi. So <laughs> I'm sure they were. There was something they said that made that happen. <laughs> wow. And I, I can. I mean, what you alluded to there at the end. If we don't allow God's word to tell us who we are, then we'll allow everybody else to tell us, the world to tell us. And, and maybe yeah, it'd be interesting just to hear your reflections on how you think that plays out in, in church and in leadership circles and what women and men and um, what we're expecting for. Or, you know, we can get drawn into the game of hierarchy and power because the world talks in leadership in those terms a lot of the time. Um, and if we pursue that from a kind of a, a poverty mindset, of not knowing who we are in Christ, it's always going to be toxic anyway. What, um, yeah? Can you can you speak into how you've navigated that space as a as a woman in leadership in church life and how your identity and the, what the, some of the challenges have been, perhaps, and how that's the identity things help? Yeah, I, I think so. Early on, um, I mean, Toppy, Toppy and I have been lead in leadership in the church for quite a while now, um, and I think early on you get read a narrative as to what a woman leader is supposed to be or you know maybe you're supposed to just do kids work and serve the tea and coffee <laughs> um but the more you read the word of god the more you realize that actually that's a wrong narrative there's nothing wrong i i lead the kids work till today that's where i serve um within church at the moment um 
So, and it's something I've done for, for a long time. But I often felt, I, I never felt, I don't know how to put this. I never felt put out by it. That, oh, I never sat there and thought I could do that. I could be up there preaching because it never crossed my mind that that's who God wanted. That's what the space God wanted me to be in. But I think as I grew and as my seasons of life changed, and I think that's really important, you know, I, you, <laughs> if someone said to me, could you put a sermon together when my kids were still little? I'd be like, what are you talking about? I can barely get, you know, out the door. But I think as things began to change and I began to grow in my walk with God and began to see that actually I do have leadership giftings. I think it was important to be in a place where they recognised that and then made room without feeling threatened by it. Um, and I think I thank God that, you know, our church, Jubilee Church is such a place that um, nurtures women and grows and wants women to step into what God has called them into. So you can almost sometimes have the narrative, oh, you're not, you're not supposed to be that person. But I think one of the interesting things that I, I think I used to struggle with because I led in the workplace. I led, and I knew that I led very well in the workplace. And I saw so many women leading really well in the workplace. And then you come into the church and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah you're not allowed to lead. <laughs> And it just didn't make sense um, because if anything, you should be saying, wow, you've got these giftings, let's use it for God. Mm. Um, but also there's uh, that sense of being, I'm just, I'm a very, I, I am content, hence I, I, do, I have preached on contentment, I've asked myself and I kind of, you know, wherever I am, I'm like, Lord, whatever it is you want me to do in this space, then please let it be. So that if I'm not on stage and I trust that this is where God wants me to be, but I do feel that, you know, churches need to create an atmosphere where women don't feel like, oh, my voice is not allowed to be heard. And again, representation matters. Mm -hmm. So every time I get up there and I, you know, do something, another woman's thinking, oh, okay, so there is space for me. Mm. And it's almost giving them, you know, the, the permission to step up and say, and, and let, let their calling or their talents be known. Um, and, you know, we're called to lead in so many different areas as well. It doesn't always have to be upfront in church. You know, you, um, you know, like, like you said, I worked as a nurse, I had a 25 year career in nursing. And I really felt even though Toppy was leading the church and, and pastoring and all that. I never felt that I was called to do that. I was called to be in the workplace. And to that was that was my ministry area. And so for me, it was never a tension. I was like, God's called me to be in the workplace. That's where I lead, that's where I but um 2019, I, I felt, you know, just before 20, I felt God saying, okay, it's time to focus full time on, on ministry. And plus things were getting really busy as well. And it was a wrench, really. And then you say that I'm, you know, I'm quite busy now, but actually it's not until I, it's not until I obeyed God's call to come out of the workplace. And all of a sudden it's like, because one of the things I didn't want to do is give up work and then be bored. And then God's like, you have no idea what I've got in store for you. <laughs> um, so I think it's being confident in who God has called you to be. But on the other side, church is making sure that they create spaces and recognize the gifting that God has given women. Mm. That's really helpful. Thank you. I think it's beautiful. Um, you know, you said in the workplace, it might be one thing in the church. We ought to be the people who celebrate the gifts that God's given us mm. um, rather than constantly be worried about, I don't know, holding particular offices or doing this particular function and role in the church. I think, yeah, I think there's a great mission out there. We need to, you need to mobilize all of the, all of the workers for the harvest, don't we? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can we, I've, I mean, our time has essentially come to the end as much as there's lots of other things I'd love to have gone with and talked about with you. We'll have to get you to come back another time uh, and, <laughs> and talk about your passion for, for end of life care, educating and, and helping people prepare for death and also look after people afterwards. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, I'd love to ask you questions about that, but I'm going to stop myself because that would, <laughs> that would, that would be a whole other avenue we could go down. But um, just as we do close, is there anything else in your heart or mind that you'd love to just share with us before, before we finish? Um, just quickly to say, you know, one of the uh, things that God has been laying on my heart recently is um, just the whole area of making disciples. And like I said, I've been reading Matthew and the, just really dwelling on that. And 
for each and every one of us that, you know, the Great Commission is still the Great Commission and we can forget it in the busyness of ministry and the busyness of life. But, you know, just really encouraging people to go back and read it again and do what God says. That was his last command to us and are we doing it and so that's where I'm living at the moment raising a lot of women and pouring into them and making sure that they're actually making an impact out there in the world we want women who and men who are not just you know consumers of the word but actually they're out there and dispensing it and so within sort of the whole courage and and, and stuff like that is raising women who can then go back so things like the um uh, Sarah Everett, Everard case that mm. recently happened, the young lady who got mm. murdered, and just talking about the whole area of gender-based violence, and, and, and I know you had somebody on your podcast who spoke about it, I was like, yes, we need more people in those areas speaking, and if we don't raise disciples within the church, then we're not raising people who are able to occupy those spaces and do what God, God has called us to do, so I'll mm. leave it at like that. Oh, man, <laughs> superb. Thank you so much. It's it. I mean, it seems that the subject that we've been talking a lot about of fear is something that, you know, and all of the things we've been talking about, whether race or violence against women or using the gifts God's given you or understanding your identity, processing unforgiveness. Fear is something that we really as, as believers need to go to war against because yeah. um, it will hold us back. Hence your conference and charity, Courageous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you are on point. <laughs> <laughs> courage conference. Yeah. Again, you know, it's from what God has done within me that the, the whole courage thing has come out. And actually there are lots of women who need to step out into who into the god-given person that they've been created to be so amen amen 